All right. Welcome into another week of Surviving Paradise, the podcast that takes a look at the quote unquote spiritual paradise claimed by Jehovah's Witnesses, in particular, the governing body, the leadership group of Jehovah's Witnesses. If you are unfamiliar with that term, let me just tell you that they claim we are living in a spiritual paradise today. If you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses with your eye on the prize of a physical paradise in the future. But you know what? We're going to take a walk through those claims as we do every week. And I appreciate you joining me. And thanks again for another week of great DMs and actually some pretty interesting questions and comments from some of the great folks who have taken the time to listen to this podcast. I greatly, greatly appreciate that. So thank you to each and every one of you. You've actually had me thinking on a couple of subjects. It's great to meet some new friends as well. Most, of course, being those that have left Jehovah's Witnesses or are in the process. We really try to make this podcast warm and welcoming. It is 100% designed to help people, to get them to think, to get them to take a look at their own literature. You don't need this podcast. You don't need apostate books. You don't need all the things that they warn you against. Just please study your own literature. And I have been out of Jehovah's Witnesses as I often start my preamble here. Uh, for those that may be just stumbling into the podcast on this episode, was an 11 year elder, grew up in the 70s and 80s. And I have been out since 2009. So some of the phrases, the acronyms and the titles now that are big among Jehovah's Witnesses, I literally had to learn what they meant. Uh, PIMO, physically in, mentally out. And I'm hoping that whether by accident or divine providence, whatever the case may be, there are some PIMIs who may land on this podcast, which I have come to learn stands for physically in, mentally in. And I'm hoping that some of the stuff we talk about gets you to think, gets you to go on a deeper dive in your own literature. I always caution you to be careful. And we try to take a subject each and every week that is of great interest to those of us that have left or are leaving or those that are suffering in silence, a PMO among Jehovah's Witnesses. The goal is to help other people have some laughs, have some fun. And as I mentioned, probably from the initial episode, at times there might be even be tears. So, and that's understandable. And I have to say that I think this week may be one of those subjects that hits hard. Uh, in my opinion, I don't know if there's a more difficult subject outside of death itself. And there's some that still think this is worse than that. And it, it is very likely to trigger feelings, emotions. It certainly didn't me as I sat to think about it as someone that has been on both sides of this. As I mentioned, I was an elder and I've had family members that were part of this. And then, of course, now I'm not a witness. But this particular subject in my opinion, is the hammer of Jehovah's Witnesses. Particularly, again, when I speak of the witnesses, it isn't just publishers or those that may be associated in their estimated 8 million plus people, but it really points at leadership. It points at the people, those eight guys in upstate New York, at the top of the food chain, so to speak. They are the ones who promote these types of teachings. And for them, I believe this week we're talking about one that they use as a hammer to control people. And my God, I, I don't even know how to hold back the emotions that I personally feel for this one. And I've got some weird ones. I've got some weird perspective on this as someone who is no longer a witness, but also was an elder and took part in this crap. And I've seen firsthand the damage it does. It has done to people and continues to do to people, continues to do to people, especially young people. So without further ado, what is that subject? I want to take a look at the tragic history of disfellowshipping, shunning the ones you love and the mass destruction and misery that this particular doctrine, this belief system, this hammer is was and does to people, people who might be in their lowest moment, people who may need help more than ever. 
Instead, we have a group of guys in upstate New York that believe that just fellowshipping and shunning people is truly loving. They have the nerve, the guts, the balls, whatever words you want to put to it to claim that this arrangement of shunning people that you know, those that you love, those that you may share the most intimate of relationships with is in fact a loving act. So I want to take a look at the history of this. And I think it's only fair just minutes into this episode to say, look, trigger warning, trigger warning. This is an emotionally loaded subject. It's literally caused death. Not to one or two people, not a handful, but many. It is incredibly evil, destructive, and damaging to anybody that touches it. Not just the person who may be disfellowshipped from Jehovah's Witnesses, but the people who honor it, the people who make the decision. And it, look, from the outset, I have to tell you, therapy is important. I, I was an elder for 11 years, and folks, I've disfellowshipped people. I've done this. I've done it. I got goosebumps just talking about it. It makes me sick. And it took years for me to unravel the misery of this. And I want to say, in fairness to those that might be listening that know me personally, but I, I imagine most don't, that I was really seen as a really loving elder. I didn't do a lot of this. I was someone who tried to avoid this literally at all cost. But it still happened. It still happened. So let's take a look at disfellowshipping and the history of disfellowshipping, where this insanity came, came from. I, I fear at the outset this is going to be a solemn episode. But in my viewpoint, this needs to be addressed to capture the weight of so many other subjects that have come before this episode and those that will come after it. Because it's this one hammer, this thing, that they use and they wield to control and destroy the lives of Jehovah's Witnesses. It, I'm wary of this one. I'm wary of this subject. I've had to work up to it. And I feel like I'm saying that about every subject. You I'm a repeater. I'm a rambler. I'm working on that, folks, for those of us that have given, given some feedback. Uh, but be warned, this is one of those that you simply can't unpack, tackle, examine without really taking a look at what they've said about it and how they created it. And so there's going to be a lot of references. Maybe that's good with some people. I certainly think it's good for those who may be listening in and have doubts or want to understand this particular subject. For others, might not be as entertaining, maybe not as much wisecracks, sarcasm, fun, laughter, as we've had in recent weeks. I like the edges as a human being, so I go back and forth. I vacillate. But this subject is so god-awful. There's so much to discuss on this subject that I fear it's going to take a couple of episodes, so I apologize in advance for the length. Simply stated, disfellowshipping is as serious as it gets for Jehovah's Witnesses, and it is the chief weapon. It is a weapon of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. And this weapon has led to undefinable immeasurable damage, destruction, and misery. It's separated people. It's blown up families. It's taken children from parents. It's, it's broken up mates, people that were married. It's likely that some of us that are listening or, again, have stumbled on this podcast by accident or divine providence uh, can probably relate to maybe we're disfellowshipped. Maybe we're being shunned without the formal announcement of disfellowshipping. Whatever the case, I'm really sorry. I'm very, very, very sorry that you've gone through this or might be facing it now. But let's talk about it. So for me personally, I just want to say I was never disfellowshipped, mostly, mostly frankly, because I was a well-known elder in the area that I served in. And for those that know me, I'm fiery, I'm passionate, I'm emotional, probably comes across on this podcast, and I dared them to. <laughs> That's just the truth. I took one look at them, and I said, I dare you to follow me out this door, and if I hear my name 
in your mouth, we're going to have a problem. And they walked away. So I dodged any kind of formal disfellowshipping when I decided to leave as an elder and Jehovah's Witnesses. But I can tell you that I've most certainly been the victim of shunning. Uh, many members of my family shun me to this day. Those that are Jehovah's Witnesses, people I love immensely. Uh, I have, again, family in multiple states in the United States that are witnesses that no longer talk to me. I haven't talked to him for 10 or 12 years. Recently saw my cousin. I was the best man in his wedding in a restaurant, and I was shunned in our mid-50s. Hadn't seen him in 10, 15 years, I don't believe. So I know what it feels like. And I'm different. And we'll talk about that another time. But I know the pain that comes with this subject. So in this matter of disfellowshipping or shunning, in my opinion, you're never going to get new light on this. And I want to underline that's my opinion. I could be wrong. Okay. As of the date of this 2022, I don't believe that you will ever see new light or adjustments to disfellowshipping or shunning. And I, I've long held that belief on two doctrines of Jehovah's Witnesses. The first one is blood and the blood transfusion issue. They've tried to dance around it. There's fractions. Uh, organ transplants are allowed. They weren't usually. Uh, we could take uh, cheese. We could take lettuce. We could take mayonnaise. We could take mayo. We can take two pieces of bread, but we can't eat a sandwich. That's my... <laughs> take on the blood doctrine to date. And the second one is this one, disfellowshipping. I don't think you will see new light on either of these subjects. Why? Because in my opinion, based on many hours dealing with it, it would open Pandora's box. It, it would open Pandora's box primarily on litigation, <laughs> lawyers and courts, lawsuits. These those two teachings that I just mentioned have left decades of destruction in their wake, death. They've literally left death in their wake. And I'm not talking figuratively. I'm talking physically. Families destroyed. So many suicides that it just puts a lump in my throat to even talk about it. So I don't believe that they're ever going to change this doctrine. If you're listening and you're hopeful, I can only give you my opinion. I don't think so. They simply can't afford it. And if that doesn't make you sick to your stomach, I don't know what will. They simply can't afford it financially. The fallout would be devastation to this organization. And as we know, they'll go to no ends, including sacrificing the safety of children to protect their organization. Now, before we get into what this has caused, I think I'll go back to the beginning on this one, this matter of disfellowshipping. And I can tell you that 99% of Jehovah's Witnesses have zero clue where disfellowshipping came from. They don't understand it even as they hear the word. Blunt, bold, maybe. But that's my take. That's been my experience. And listen, I want to throw myself under the bus. I was a guy armed with this weapon armed with this hammer as an elder. I hated it. I was horrified by it, but I had the power to do it. And let me assure you what I'm going to share with you tonight. I did not know. I did not understand. I went into life and death decision-making as a shepherd without any understanding of where this came from until I was walking out the door. It's sickening. It's disgraceful. And certainly I'm ashamed of it. Like I mentioned, therapy is a good thing. We have to let go of things. Nonetheless, 99% of Jehovah's Witnesses, including most elders, have no clue, zero, where this quote unquote doctrine of disfellowshipping originated or where it came from. But if you're a Jehovah's Witness right now, a PME, and you're secretly listening, my hope is that you will spend time researching this subject of disfellowshipping. Here is a blunt fact, blunt and concrete. The Jehovah's Witness version, the current version of disfellowshipping and shunning is not a Bible teaching. That is a fact. That is not my opinion. 
that is not me waxing emotional, getting fired up. It is not taught in the Bible. The word disfellowshipping is not used in the Bible. The nuance and the vibe and everything that surrounds it is not taught in the Bible. And I'll prove it to you. I will prove it to you. Not for myself, but folks, from their literature, (laughs) from where it truly came from. A bunch of guys in upstate New York. At the time it came to fruition, they were in Brooklyn. For those of us that have been around a while. In fact, the current version of disfellowshipping wasn't even taught in this organization until 1952. That's right. The way you currently view, see, and fear disfellowshipping, the hammer of the elders, didn't even come into existence until 1952. If you're wondering what was going on then, let me give you some comparisons. In 1952, Singing in the Rain premiered. For us old people, God, that's that's even old and crusty for this guy. My mom loved it. Gene Kelly, Singing in the Rain. But here's one you might relate to. In 1952, Mr. Potato Head hit the toy market and was being sold. The first roll-on deodorant under, introduced under the, the name Ban Roll-On for your armpits hit the market. Our first roll-on B.O. <laughs> Unbelievable. The world's first passenger jet was produced in the United Kingdom and flew on May 2nd. And the first don't walk sign was installed in the streets of New York City. 1952. That's when disfellowshipping, shunning, and wreaking havoc on humanity found its birth. So please let that sink in for a minute. No matter where you come from, no matter how you've stumbled upon this episode or this podcast, let that sink in. To repeat, here are some concrete facts on Jehovah's Witnesses and the current form of disfellowshipping and shunning people. One, the word isn't found in that little book Jehovah says is a matter of life and death to read. You know, the one called the Bible that I just spoke of. Don't you think Jehovah should have mentioned his fellowshipping, excommunication, or shunning with millions, at, let's be honest, billions of lives on the line? Shouldn't he have mentioned it? Two, Jesus Christ, the leader of the governing body, the guy in heaven giving them all these, you know, factoids, doctrines, new light, he never taught or even mentioned disfellowshipping or anything that remotely looks like it. Three, disfellowshipping wasn't even a thing in the first century congregation. You're not going to find the apostle Peter, James, or John teaching or holding judicial committees or meetings within the first century congregation. Huh? Huh? We've heard for years that that's when the formation of Jehovah's Witnesses, not under that name, began its life. That's that's where birth took place of God's true organization, not mentioned. Disfellowshipping, for disfellowshipping wasn't the thing we currently see and, and what most people in Jehovah's Witnesses live in fear of until 1952. So, did God and his son Jesus Christ, the king, forget to outline this delicate life altering process for its loyal, for their, excuse me, loyal followers. How did true Christians live for centuries without knowledge of disfellowshipping as taught by Jehovah's witnesses and enforced by Jehovah's witnesses today? How did all of this happen? I want to insert a note here, and this comes to us In modern times, the September 2021 Watchtower on page 30 has this beautiful box with four points on disfellowshipping that should raise these questions in your mind. I encourage you to look this up and go find it real quickly. The box is titled, No Irony Here, Disfellowshipping, 
Jehovah's loving discipline at work. Shunning people is loving, and Jehovah says so. It says, how does the disfellowshipping arrangement reflect God's love? Newsflash, it doesn't. But guess what? They've got four points proving that it does. Number one, love motivates the elders to make every effort to help wrongdoers. A Christian is disfellowshipped only if two factors coincide. He has committed a serious sin, and he is not repentant. In point one, how loaded is that? Where is there any indication that elders have the ability to read minds or hearts? They can certainly listen to a confession of serious sin, but how in the hell does another man know the feelings of an introvert, a shy person, a person mentally sick, a damaged person, someone who's been abused? How do they know if they're truly repentant of some wrong that they committed? Number two in the box, disfellowshipping protects the congregation. An unrepentant sinner is like a person who has a highly contagious viral infection and needs to be quarantined in order to protect others from getting sick. So here we are, and here we get a snapshot into the minds, hearts, and thinking of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. Someone who commits a sin, and again, they always throw in the word unrepentant without any ability to judge that, without any ability to know outside of looking at them, staring at another human being in their own bias, their own background coming into play, their own imperfections, and somehow come to the conclusion they're repentant or not, based on what? They did it once or twice? Based on what? They said they liked it, but they feel bad? I'm going to save us the histrionics here. But a person who commits a sin now and as they deem unrepentant is like a viral infection, diseased, sick, despite the fact that we all sin. But this person needs to be quarantined. Number three in the box, disfellowshipping may move a sinner to repent. Yeah, we're going to unpack that one. Many who got disfellowshipped were jolted to their senses and in time returned to Jehovah. No, no, they were not. I can tell you as an elder, ah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Number four, when a repentant wrongdoer returns, the heavens rejoice and the congregation welcomes him back. So no word yet on how we're confirming the rejoicing and the partying going on in heaven. We'll have to get back to you on proof that when a repentant person says they're sorry and tries to stop sinning, there's a party in heaven, there's rejoicing. But here's one thing I can assure you. And if you're listening and you have been disfellowshipped, it is very likely you've experienced this. The congregation does not welcome you back. Sure, there may be people who do. Your family who's missed you will. Those of us who are close to you and loved you will. Absolutely. Missed you so bad. You would be shocked to learn from disfellowship people who have been reinstated the level of cold shoulder of being ostracized, of not being invited to dinners or out to social events after being reinstated because the stigma hangs. It just hangs over you, particularly if you've been disfellowshipped for a long time. We'll get back to that. But this box claims that disfellowshipping is, in fact, a loving act of Jehovah God. So I ask you, here are some questions, and you likely have some, several questions. But consider a couple basic ones. Did Jehovah just not love anyone that was alive prior to 1952? Because that's when this started, this loving arrangement, as they call it. Did Jesus forget to give Watchtower leadership the memo regarding Jehovah's love for mankind and sinners? Did Jesus just, did he miss this one? The number one way to discipline a serious sinner, he forgot to mention it. Was there no forgiveness for sins or rejoicing in heaven prior to 1952? Because that's, again, you're going to hear it a lot. That's when this arrangement landed. 
were people who did not know about this loving arrangement of shunning. Did they, they, in not knowing it, did they know that they were doomed to fireballs at Armageddon because no one told them? Because Jehovah didn't tell them Jesus? The governing body didn't exist in the 70s, so we'll say leadership leading up to that? Ah, yes. The questions are endless. I will stop there. And, and you can tell I'm emotional about this one. I'm upset about it. To claim that shunning someone is loving. To cut a human being off at their lowest part of life. When they're terrible. When they feel terrible, excuse me. When they're depressed. When they're sad. When many, and I've held them in my own arms. So you can't argue this one with me. When many are literally suicidal. You cut them off because they did it more than once, so they won't deemed repentant. We'll get more into that down the road. If disfellowshipping and shunning people, which by the way, I might mention, can only happen to a witness if they're baptized. You have to be baptized, which is why they push for this. This is why they push for you to get baptized. It's a control mechanism. If this is in fact so loving, why, oh, why do Jehovah's Witnesses live in fear of it? Disfellowshipping and shunning is like a fear cloud. It's like a cartoon, this black, dark cloud that hovers over the head of a baptized Jehovah's Witness. It could be sex, as we just talked about. It could be higher education, which we've talked about. It could be money. It could be how they spend their time, what they watch, the rating of the movie they just saw, who they associate with and who they spend time with, how they dress, how short their skirt is, if their pants are too tight, how much they drink in terms of alcohol, texting on a telephone, talking. All of these things fall under the umbrella of fear that is covered by the possibility of being disfellowshipped, of shunned. The wrong move on any one of those subjects, and I will cover probably next week many more, can lead to people being disfellowshipped and shunned, removed from the congregation it, with zero contact with anyone, including your own family. I, I want to give you a peek into my mind on this subject. I think I've stated this in a prior episode, but as I've stated before, that as, as an elder, there was a night where I was serving as the chairman on a judicial committee and the committee ended. We did not disfellowship. I tried everything humanly possible, get the other two guys to vote with me on this one. I'm just admitting it. And as the person left the room, the third elder left the room and one of the other elders that I was particularly close to slightly older than me, a little bit more experienced just based on age I was the head, I was the chairman rather of the committee, but I asked him to stay back and everyone was out of the room and I asked him something. I said, listen, when so-and-so there entered this room, what were they most afraid of? And I'll never forget the look in his face. He just stared a little confused and he thought for a few seconds and then he said, yeah, they were afraid they were going to get disfellowshipped, man. <laughs> And I just kept looking at him and I said, yeah, do you see a problem with that? They didn't fear hurting daddy, Jehovah. They didn't fear that harm in that relationship. They didn't fear that he couldn't forgive them. They didn't fear how hurt his feelings were. No, they walked into this room fearing that we would cut them off. We would shun them and we'd tell everyone else in this congregation to shun them, including their family. What is wrong with that story? He just nodded. And I remember we were in the doorway of the B-School and he walked out the door. This was the kind of stuff that tore me up as an elder. This is the stuff my brain, as I often do on this podcast, I give you a, blink, a look inside that dark place. Maybe I'm just a different personality. Maybe I'm too emotional. I've been told that. But I couldn't shake the fact that the motive, the desire, the love, they were all left outside the room. 
there wasn't a concern for Jehovah or for God himself. The sinner's mind had shifted to worrying about losing everything they knew, family, friends, jobs, privileges, on and on and on the list went. The discipline made no sense. It didn't help them nurture a relationship with God or his son. It was a hammer smashing the hell out of their life. I recognize that as an elder. I was an elder at 27 years old. And I recognize that. It only served one purpose. Disfellowshipping and shunning only serves one purpose. And that is fear to control other people. Fear, which paralyzes people. So for those that may have stumbled upon this podcast and they're unaware of what disfellowshipping entails, allow me to describe this loving arrangement in case you haven't picked up on it. I'll sum it up with two bullet points, so to speak. You are to completely shun the sinner. Treat them as though they are dead. Family, kids, relatives, friends, anyone. That means you don't look at them. You don't speak to them. You pretend they're dead. And I can tell you that I heard from many people over the years who told me it would have been easier to be dead. It would have been easier. It would have been easier if that person they loved died. Because seeing them come and sit in the back of a kingdom hall while the, all of us shunned them and treated them like, again, they had a viral infection their words, not mine, was gut-wrenching. It made them sick people. It made many people suicidal. But it's loving, according to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. And if you don't believe that they feel that way, allow me to use their words from the Watchtower of 1952, March 1st, page 134, quote, such an individual has no place in the clean congregation or organization of God. He should go back to the wicked group that he once came from and die with that wicked group, with Satan's organization, end quote. Loving. A loving arrangement. Go die with Satan. Their words, not mine. Watchtower of 1952, March 1st, page 134. I'm rambling. I'm getting upset. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. If you're listening to this and you're not familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses, and I, I doubt there's many folks listening that may be you're probably going, where the hell did this come from? Where did this come from? You've already said, podcast guy, that Jehovah didn't teach this, that God didn't, that Jesus didn't, that it didn't even show up till 1952. So for centuries and centuries, nobody knew about this, but, but now it's a loving arrangement. And people who commit sins are part of a wicked group that should go die with Satan's organization. Where did it come from? I present to you a long rambling look over the course of the rest of this episode at where this insane, destructive belief that disfellowshipping and shunning is a loving arrangement came from. Disclaimer, do not take my word for this. Please go research it. Keep in mind that as I go through this history, there was no governing body until the early 1970s. So most of this light, this truth, this arrangement came from Watchtower presidents. In this case, it was mostly Nathan Knorr, who was being influenced at the time, it, as you can see in 1952, from what many consider the Watchtower Yoda of his day, Fred Franz, who did most of the writing. Most of the writing, most of the books, for several decades and certainly during this time period. So let's go back to the beginning. And I will try, really try not to ramble here. But in the beginning, Chuck Russell and friends did mention disfellowshipping. 
Chuck Russell is Charles Taze Russell, widely seen as the first president of the Watchtower. Newsflash trivia, he wasn't. Look up William Conley, but they never mention him. <laughs> Charles Taze Russell and friends in the late 1800s actually mentioned this terminology, disfellowshipping, shunning. But take note, it was not for people who smoked a cigarette. You can be DF for that now. It wasn't for oral sex. You can be DF for that now. It wasn't for uh, voting. You can be DF for that now. It wasn't for going to the YMCA. There was a time you could be DF for that. <laughs> it was for people that denied God, denied Christianity. Not sinners, not people who made mistakes. And I'm going to cut some of this out in the interest of time and read to you one of his quotes. It's from the Watchtower of 1882. Wow, that's going back, huh? December, page 423. Notice that Chuck said, in this reference, it's okay to have differences of opinion, and he was God's prophet. Not something you're going to hear from the modern day of anybody. He says here, quote, December, page 423, Watchtower 1882. We are not of those who disfellowship Christian brethren on account of some differences of opinion. What? <laughs> they do now. <laughs> but when it comes to the point of denying the very foundation of all Christianity, we must speak out and withstand all such to the face, for they become the enemies of the cross of Christ. Yes, there's a mention of the cross. End quote. Chuck Taze Russell specifically said, we don't disfellowship people, but if they want to deny Christianity, yeah, we got to disfellowship those guys. We just don't hang around with them. We don't tell their family to shun them. We just don't hang around with them. He goes on to say, watch Terror of 1893, October 15th, page 1588. He says, to be separate does not mean to be friends and compa companions or to be in fellowship on any grounds. It means that we are to make a clean cut division between ourselves and all the unclean, the impure in heart, as manifested by the disloyalty to the truth and thereby to God, its great author. And that this separation is to be marked that the disfellowshipped one will be sure to know it and that none can make our obedience and loyalty to the Lord mistake, excuse me, our obedience and loyalty to the Lord and his truth. It was a religious issue, excuse me, end quote. Watchtower, 1893, October 15th, page 1588. It was essentially a warning against bad association, which witnesses are very big on now. Another fun topic for another day. He was essentially saying people who deny Jesus, at, we can't hang around with them. It's plain, it's in black and white, it's in print. But you will love this one from God's mouthpiece in print, calling himself the prophet of Jehovah. It is on his gravestone. I have seen it with my own eyes. The Laodicean messenger of Revelation. You will love this one from Chuck Russell. He says, quote, from the Watchtower of 1887, April, page 923, quote, rather like the Church of Rome, their religious leaders of today, in brackets, influence is exerted to restrain investigation within the sectarian limits with the implied threat of disfellowship, they urge their ministers and students not to search continually for truth, but to accept the voice of their sect as infallible, end quote. Charles Taze Russell is taking a pot shot at other religions who use disfellowshipping to keep their members in control, to keep the members who continue to do research on the religion in control. He says, we're not like those people. Wait, what? Suddenly, not suddenly, this is the 1800s, let's be honest. It was okay in the 1800s in God's organization, apparently, to disagree with the organization's teachings, and you wouldn't be disfellowshipped for it. My, how times have changed for those of us that are considered apostates, mentally diseased, and having viruses. <laughs> Again, take a walk with me here. This is at the very beginning of disfellowshipping in this organization. Note, note this. Again, a peek into my crazy head. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Chuck, Charles Taze Russell, is in heaven right now at the time of this recording. 
He's directing the eight guys in upstate New York. And Charles, or as you can tell, I like to call him Chuck, said it is okay to do research and disagree with the organization without the threat of disfellowshipping. But now Chuck is in heaven with Jesus. They're hanging out together. And he's telling the eight guys in upstate New York that they need to tell us we must have strict obedience to everything they say. Everything they tell us is truth. Never question it, because if we do, we're going to be disfellowshipped as apostates. The baptism questions state this. You have to proclaim your loyalty to the organization upon baptism. You have to stand up and say yes. <laughs> Charles Chuck said, ah, not a big deal. Other religions do that, but we don't. Now he's up in heaven with Jesus, and he's telling us something completely different, apparently, through the eight guys in upstate New York. So let's, I digress, I'm sorry, a peek inside my head. But let's continue with the timeline of this loving arrangement of disfellowshipping. So in the early 1900s, it'd be interesting for those of us who are hearing this, that the whole congregation got involved in discipline, not just elders. There wasn't even an elder arrangement, which didn't come about again until the 70s. But again, note, remember, Jesus at the time that the whole congregation was administering discipline to a sinner in the early 1900s, Jesus took a look around the entire universe and went, ha, ah, I really like these guys in New York. Jesus chose them based on what he saw in 1919, the year they claim he chose them. And so I can't help but wonder why Jesus changed his mind in 1952. He changed the discipline process. When he originally thought it was a great idea that the whole congregation just try to work with someone if they made a sin. But he made these guys his choice to speak on his behalf to all of mankind based on how they discipline sinners, which, as I just stated, the whole congregation did. Everybody got involved. It was a hug in. We're going to heal you. We're sorry that you got involved in this. What changed? Jesus loved what they were doing, and sinners were never shunned in the early 1900s. They were simply treated as an unbeliever. They were just treated as an unbeliever. They weren't shunned. You weren't required to pretend they were dead or that they were mentally diseased or that they had a virus. The congregation went, look, they keep continuing down this road. We're going to have to treat them as an unbeliever. They're just not getting on board here. Not just the elders, no B school involved, no judicial committee with three men. The sinners weren't on stage with everyone pointing and laughing at them. No. They just simply stated in the early 1900s look, they're acting like an unbeliever. We need to make them aware of that. And then we need to hope that they come around. Would you like a reference to this? <laughs> Quote, the administration of discipline is not the function of the elders only, but of the entire church. Thus, it is evident that the elders were in no sense to be judges of the members hearing and judgment were left to the local body or church. Indeed, even if the transgressor refused to hear and obey the decision of the entire church, church, no punishment is to be inflicted or even attempted. What then? Merely the church is to withdraw from him its fellowship in any and all signs or manifestations of brotherhood. Thenceforth, the offender is to be treated as a heathen man and a publican. Study Series 6, The New Creation of 1904, pages 289 and 290. 290, excuse me. You are not to even think of punishment. As it said, to be inflicted or even to be attempted. Punishment was never part of the equation in the early 1900s. And Jesus looked around and said, I like the way they do this. These are my guys. The Watchtower of 1905, pages, page 3,673 states, quote, the scriptural basis of fellowship and disfellowshipping is both a much broader and much more simple one. It is simply of two parts. One, an acceptance of Christ as the Redeemer, and two, a full consecration to him. Whoever complies with this scriptural formula 
is entitled to the love, respect, sympathy, and care of every other such one. For such and such only constitute the church which God recognizes, the church whose names are written in heaven. Watchtower, 1905, page 3,673. If you simply believed in Jesus, if you simply had an interest in a relationship with him, you couldn't be disfellowshipped. According to Chuck Taze Russell and what Jesus saw in 1919, this is what they were doing. And he said, I like this. These guys are in line with what I'm teaching. But here's one of my favorites. As we get closer to Jesus proclaiming these were his guys, those guys in upstate New York today, the Watchtower of 1919, March 1st, page 69, said this. According to this scripture, the very most that the church could do would be that after having vainly endeavored to get the brother to repent and reform, it should withdraw special brotherly fellowship from him until such a time as he would express willingness thereafter to do right. Then he should be received again into full fellowship. In the meantime, the brother may merely be treated in the kindly, courteous way in which it would be proper for us to treat any publican or Gentile, withholding the special privilege, excuse me, special rights or privileges or greetings or voting opportunities that belong to the church as a class separate from the world, end quote. Did you catch that? If someone was unrepentant in their sin, and again, Jesus chose them based on what they were doing, they were to be, and I quote, merely be treated in the kindly, courteous way in which it would be proper for us to treat any publican or Gentile. Simply withdraw the special privileges. They can't vote, can't vote on stuff at the congregation. So on this loving arrangement of disfellowshipping in its earliest mentions, it does not remotely resemble what Jehovah's Witnesses are doing today. So if you're keeping score at home, Jesus chose the guys in New York in 1919, remember? And he loved the idea of how they handled sinners. It must have been one of the reasons he chose them. He loved it more than any other religion on earth. What were they teaching? I just read it to you. To even treat the most hardened sinner as kindly, as considerate, courteous. Jesus went from treating sinners kindly in the Bible. Do I need to mention the Samaritan woman? Or Mary Magdalene? Or tax collectors, or apostate Jews, or the apostle Peter denying him three times, or how about this one, a guy hanging next to him on a stake, bleeding out and dying as a criminal? Jesus went from believing that even those people should be treated kindly and with courtesy to what we see today. That's what has apparently dramatically changed. In 1919, he chose this organization. Judge Joe Rutherford won apparently the heavenly lottery when Jesus said, there's my guy, there's my, there's my guys, to suddenly, without any foundation or any basis, just a few decades later, to sinners are a contagious virus. They are diseased. They need to be quarantined. As the box said at the outset of this episode, September 2021 Watchtower. Nice. And folks, it's all in print. It's all in print. What happened? Does what we see in these references from the 1900s when Jesus chose this organization resemble what we have today? Look, I'm repeating myself. It does not. We don't treat disfellowship people with courtesy or just as a publican, as an unbeliever. Like, hey, I know you've been sinning and we don't agree, but 
I still will be kind to you. Nope, we don't do that at all. They're supposed to be dead. They're diseased. It's truly shocking and unbelievable to see how this doctrine has morphed and the damage that it has done to countless millions of people right up to death. To take it further on this long rambling episode and historical peak at disfellowshipping among Jehovah's Witnesses, Chuck Taze Russell and Judge Rutherford, the first two presidents of the Watchtower Bible Tract Society, didn't even dis disfellowship people for disagreeing with them or their teachings. Can you even picture that today? You simply cannot disagree with the governing body. You are an apostate and you are disfellowshipped as the most vile human being on earth. But the first two guys, when Jesus was really taking note of this situation across the entire universe, they didn't feel that way. They didn't feel that way at all. They literally said that it was okay to disagree with them. It's unbelievable. The Watcher of 1919, February 1st, page 6,385, it was thick, says this, quote, The great adversary is wily and at all times is quick to appeal to passion. He persuades some that they must take a radical stand against some secular work or activity and to proceed at once to disfellowship others who cannot conscientiously take that same stand. Somehow, they seem to think that their radical stand entitles them in a very special sense to divine favor and blessing. His attitude leads them to violate principle in various ways. One, by judging and condemning others who do not see as they do. Two, by refusing to fellowship those who still believe in the ransom, the restitution, the high calling. Satan's organization sails under the high-sounding name of Christendom. It boasts of a membership of over 500 million persons. Its members are in bondage to creed. Does this sound familiar? Its members are in bondage to creeds, customs, rites, and ceremonies. They dare not disown these or criticize or expose them. To do so would bring down on their heads taunts, reproaches, disfellowshipping, and persecution. Many thousands of the Lord's people are held in these denominations as prisoners, afraid to express their disapproval of the creeds, methods, and customs of the organization. Watchtower, 1930, October 1st, page 301. If you're not catching what they were saying in the beginning, it was simple. Disfellowshipping the way Jehovah's Witnesses recognize it today and administer it to people they were calling out as being part of false religion at the beginning of the last century the president said this god's chosen mouthpiece was encouraging members to question things ah yes did we mention they also believe that the same guy here in 1930 judge rutherford is also in heaven helping jesus direct the eight guys in upstate new york today I, I mean, I can't. Here comes here comes comedy. I can't help but wonder. Judge Joe Rutherford was an alcoholic. He loved alcohol. He disobeyed prohibition and and smuggled alcohol into Bethel. I can't I can't help but wonder. Does he have a special affinity for Tony Morris, <laughs> considering they both like a stiff drink? <laughs> I, but what's shocking is that we are to believe that Jesus looked throughout the whole earth, looked at these guys and said, I love what they're doing. And these guys on the matter of disfellowshipping said, oh, that's what Christendom does. We would never think of that. We would never impose that. We think it's evil. They compared it to the wiles of Satan. So you might ask, well, what was supposed to happen when someone committed a sin during this time period among Jehovah's Witnesses? How do they handle it in the congregation? And note, the list of sins that require discipline has massively changed. And we'll get into that in a future episode. This one's already getting long. But in the Watchtower of 1944, May 15th, pages 151 and 152, 
it says the responsibility to judge an individual was moved from the congregation to representatives of the congregation. Uh-oh, things are changing suddenly. Things are changing. Tays is in heaven. The judge is in heaven. Jesus is in heaven. And they're telling the guys in 1944 that, ah, the congregation's been helping sinners. Now we're going to say it's a select few in the congregation. And here's where this gets absolutely mind-boggling. I want to go back and read this quote. Watchtower of 1944, May 15th, pages 151, 152. Quote, responsibility to judge an individual was moved from the congregation to representatives of the congregation. Note no mention of elders. Despite admitting Matthew 18 directs the entire congregation to decide if a person is a wrongdoer, this would change to involve a limited number of representatives because the process described by Jesus, by Jesus, in Matthew 18, has served to cause more controversy and disruption among congregations in times past than almost any other thing. End quote. Did you hear that? They literally put into print, Watchtower of 1944, that they thought Jesus had become a pain in the ass and they no longer had to follow it. Nope. Matthew 18, eh, it's a real pain in the butt. Jesus had it wrong. That son of God guy we claim to follow has really caused some problems in the congregations, some controversy. So we're going to change this to a few select people who get to vote on whether the sinner over there is a good guy, bad guy, gets to stay or gets to be shunned. You can't make this stuff up. You simply can't. From 1944, you can see this thing evolving from the early 1900s to the quotes of the 30s to now we're into the 40s here. From the Council on Theocratic Organization for Jehovah's Witnesses, 1949, page 57, said this, quote, If an individual associated with a company persists in wrongdoing and does not act according to the scriptures as is becoming a Christian, then the representative members of the congregation who are the servants in the company, the mature ones, or spiritually, spiritually qualified, can decide what course should be taken. Huh? At a left field and literally quotes Matthew 18 in parentheses, the same scripture in 44 they said had become a real thorn in their side. Goes on, quote, the scriptural admonition is to have nothing to do with wrongdoers who seek to cause divisions. The mature brethren of responsibility would so advise the congregation disfellowshipping the wrongdoer. So you see, even then, there wasn't a list of things that would, as they move into this shunning dynamic, even then, it was just for people causing divisions. It wasn't for smoking. It wasn't for oral sex. It wasn't for voting. It wasn't for taking up arms, joining the military. It wasn't for any of those things that now you can be disfellowshipped for. It was literally only for people causing division in the congregation. Again, not smoking, not drinking, not oral sex. But before we jump into how disfellowshipping suddenly morphed into what we see today, and I'm going to say now we're going to have to cover it more in another episode as this one is going long. Before we jump into how it took its current form, we're stopping here in 1949. Consider what, in my mind, the one admission that proves the level of dishonesty, of lying, of control, and a full-blown cult status that rises above all other references you're going to find in the Library of Jehovah's Witnesses. And let me tell you here, trigger warning, they know what they're doing is evil. They know shunning is damaging. And furthermore, they know that shunning is not taught in the Bible. I present to you the Awake of January 8th, 1947, page 27 under the article, Are You Also Excommunicated? This article goes on to vilify shunning, disfellowshipping, and excommunication because it's what the Catholic Church is doing. 
they literally, the, the, the disfellowshipping, the dynamic that we know today, literally in this article is compared to false religion. It says, and I'm reading from the article, I'm not going to read it all, says this means that you are looked upon with the blackest contempt by the Vatican, being cursed and damned with the devil and his angels. All who have been baptized are liable to excommunication, even Protestants who have never belonged to the true church, <laughs> since by their baptism they are really her subjects, though of course rebellious ones. Protestants can be excommunicated. It goes on, and I'm highlighting here, please look this up. The authority for excommunication, they claim, is based on the teachings of Christ and the apostles as found in the following scriptures. Guess what? There's Matthew 18 again. However, the writer of this article in The Awake of 1947 says, this teaching finds no support in these scriptures. In fact, it is altogether foreign to Bible teachings. Where then did this practice originate? The Encyclopedia Britannica says that papal excommunication is not without pagan influence and its variations cannot be adequately explained unless account be taken of several non-Christian analogs of excommunication. January 8, 1947, page 27. Are you also excommunicated? It's the most destructive reference to disfellowshipping and what they know to be untrue. They know it's untrue. They compared it to pagan beliefs. They compared it to Catholicism, to Christendom, who they believe is going to be destroyed by Jesus himself. It goes on to claim in this article, quote, the weapon of excommunication became the instrument by which the clergy attained a combination of ecclesiastical power and secular tyranny that finds no parallel in history. End quote. If you're stumbling upon this issue of disfellowshipping and you're looking at this, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to understand where it came from. As we look to next week's episode, as this one has run long, I'm going to bring us up to modern times in a part two. And I apologize for the references. It's not my style. I don't think it's very entertaining or hopefully it's interesting. Hopefully it's helping someone. But it's in 1952 where they went off the rails. Because as you can see in 1947, 1944, 1930, the early 1900s, just fellowshipping was seen as something the congregation just decided on. That someone was still to be treated with courtesy and kindness. In 1947, it was compared to something Satan invented by the Catholic Church. That it was a hammer used in terms of power and that it found no parallel in all of human history as an element of control over human beings. But suddenly, it all changes in 1952. And so this is a bit of a teaser this week. Many have asked why Nathan Knorr changed all of this. We'll get into that in part two of this loving arrangement of disfellowshipping. But I can, I can share this as we close, why should anyone care about a cult, a religion, an organization? They, they likened it to a job, shunning people. Let me just tell you this as we move into how it came about in the next episode. Disfellowshipped ones believe, believing in the Watchtower doctrine or believed by those who believe in the Watchtower Doctrine, are expected to be killed at Armageddon. They have no hope. They're dead. If Armageddon comes now, disfellowship people are dead. Disfellowship ones that don't agree with Watchtower teachings, despite what you've heard, <laughs> realize that they will never again associate with Jehovah's Witnesses, their family, their friends, their mothers, their fathers, their daughters, their kids, their grandparents. 
Children raised as Jehovah's Witnesses understand that the love of their parents is completely conditional if they get baptized. They must stay part of the religion or they too will be shunned by their parents. Even if they're baptized at a young age and have no clue what they're committing to. Some Jehovah's Witnesses literally stay. And, and I will say, we'll tackle this next week. We're going to leave this here. But the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses that I venture guess are PIMO are doing so so that they don't lose their family. So why care? Why care about this history? Why tune into this? <laughs> Hopefully it's interesting. Hopefully it helps someone. But for what this fellowshipping does to another human being, it's imperative to understand that there's nothing loving about it. It has led to death. Lots of it. And in the very least, it's left to emotional damage, the destruction of families, and the list goes on and on and on. And I hate closing on such a nasty note. I tried to, in somewhat organized fashion, compile this subject. As we get into part two in the next episode, we're going to pick up in 1952. And in 1952, is where Jehovah's Witnesses and what we currently understand is disfellowshipping came into effect. And let me tell you this, I'll share rumors as to why it happened and I'm going to share the vitriol and the nastiness behind this entire teaching and why the governing body uses it as the destructive hammer that it is right now in 2022. I want to thank you if you made it to the end of this one. It was a long one. I'm really working on that, folks, uh, to respect everyone's time. But I hope that you got something out of this, at least a snapshot of the history of disfellowshipping through the late 1800s, 1900s, why it's so damaging. And next week, we're going to get into where and why it ended up exactly like it is today. I want to thank you for listening. Like, subscribe. I hope that you're all doing well out there. I appreciate the feedback. Please tune in for part two on why disfellowshipping is far from a loving arrangement. I will see you next week. And to all those commenting again, many thanks. Be well. We'll see you next week here on Surviving Paradise. <laughs>